Welcome to the conversation. My name is Paul Grondahl. I'm the director of the New York State Writers Institute at the University of Albany. We're very excited about our guest uh, today, Kristen Miyares Young, all the way from Seattle, Washington, which is my uh, hometown. We're going to talk about the Northwest, Salish country, and, and all those things. But I should mention very briefly, she's got a long, interesting uh, biography. But Kristen is an investigative journalist, a teacher an essayist, a book critic, and a novelist. She, her debut novel is called Subduction, published recently by Red Hen Press, getting tremendous reviews. Um, Paris Review made it a staff pick. Washington Post called it whip smart. And many other literary uh, uh, critics are, are weighing in with high praise for this wonderful debut novel. Kristen, welcome to the Writers Institute Conversation. Thanks for having me here. So we, we, we have a few kind of similar threads in our narrative. You started as a journalist. You came from the East Coast to the West Coast. I came from the West Coast to the East Coast. But tell me, how did you get into journalism? Because I saw you majored in, in history, at the primarily well, history and literature at Harvard. But how did you get involved in journalism in your earliest part of your career? Well, so while I was at Harvard, I uh, participated in a foreign exchange program that has been closed down since as a result of the ongoing cyclical embargoes against Cuba. But I went to the University of Havana for a semester. And while I was there, I noticed two things, uh, that there was uh, incredibly visible presence of sex work in the streets. And uh, that really called my attention uh, because these women were often uh, my age, uh, or they were the ages of people that I knew in my life, and I felt like they were um, my peers, but peers who had faced a different set of circumstances than the one that brought me to Harvard um, after my parents uh, emigrated. And so I wanted to explore what it meant uh, to be in this kind of intersection of privilege, transnational politics, racial politics and the socioeconomic truths of the legacies of slavery and other forms of oppression. And so I began uh, a research project, uh, which became my uh, thesis, and realized uh, that project was on the basis of gumshoe reporting. I went back, I got a grant from Harvard uh, to go back, and I spent a summer walking with sex workers and interviewing their Johns and interviewing police officers, interviewing uh, politicians, if I could get one to talk to me, uh, interviewing academics, trying to figure out what was the context for the constructions of these women's identities through rhetoric and legal system and uh, literary production. And what did that say, not about the women, but about the society itself? And so when I realized um, in my mind, that was transnational scholarship, right? But then I thought, well, that's journalism also. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that it would be possible uh, to take the spirit of inquiry, which had motivated my scholarly activity up until that time, and to combine it with what I still call gumshoe reporting, I thought, okay, well, that's something that is of value, uh, not just to me, but also to society. And I do believe that we write, whether as an investigative journalist or an essayist or a book critic or a novelist, we write to improve the quality of ideas that are available to society. And I found journalism to be uh, the entree into that world. So another thing we, we have in common, I do not have a journalism degree. I actually never took a class in journalism. Did you take any classes in journalism or just on, on the job training basically? Huh? You get good quick. Yeah. It's um, embarrassing, but you get good quick when you learn on the job. So you end up in Seattle at the Seattle Post Intelligencer, which is this paper I read you know, growing up. Um, also owned by the Hearst Corporation, where I spent my career here in Albany at the Times Union, part of the Hearst Corporation. How did you end up at that paper, as opposed to the hundreds and hundreds of other papers around the country? Well, so when I was at Harvard, I uh, decided that magazine journalism was going to be what I wanted to do. So I was very lucky to get an internship at Time Magazine. Um, unfortunately, even though I did very well during that internship, right in the middle of it, I had a bout of uh, cancer. Uh, ovarian cancer, uh, which was borderline tumor, but you know, they didn't give me a job offer. <laughs> so, <laughs> they don't exist anymore anyway. I think you took the right turn. Time the, the came crumbling down since then. So, 
Yeah. I also didn't like the ways that their stories were constructed. I don't believe in a factory approach to writing a story. Uh, despite the fact of, that I lament the loss of fact checkers, um, I do believe in having ownership of a process and its quality from the beginning to the very end. And so uh, anything that obviates that introduces all of the vagaries of bureaucracy, and that is not a good thing in narrative. Um, so in Time Magazine, that was a cul-de-sac. Uh, so then I went out into the Buenos Aires Herald and became a uh, intern there working for uh, the business desk mostly, but also looking at Metro. And of course, you know, it was a time of economic privation in Buenos Aires. And so then I learned kind of the privileges that I'd had with just a steady in internet connection, just the capacity to sit on a computer for several hours in a row. And I was in the newsroom and uh, they also have closed since, even though they've been open since the 1860s, I think. Um, they started off as a Scottish uh, shipping news paper. Oh. Uh, and uh, it was a book critic actually kind of tapped me on the shoulder and was like, so um, when are you gonna get off the internet? I was like, oh, well, I'm just working. He's like, well, we share that computer, everyone. And I was like, oh, oh. Uh, pardon me. I'm so sorry. I will never do that again. My apologies. The intern sitting on the computer that's for the whole newsroom, you know, and their, their kindness and generosity because they realized, you know, right. Uh, but I noticed then just how much work people do to cushion uh, the fragility of privilege. Right. Right. I should mention you're, you're bilingual because I know you teach creative writing and English and Spanish, right? Have you always gone back and forth even in, in your writing too? Or, or um, did you write in Spanish for the Buenos Aires paper? Or? No, the, it was an English language paper. I have reported a fair amount in Spanish uh, from that time until this day. Uh, but I write in English. I am raising my children in Spanish, so it's very much a part of my life. But in terms of my creative production, it's all in English. Right. So you got to the Post Intelligencer in what year? That was in 2004. And the thing is, is that, so I couldn't stay in Buenos Aires, right? The currency, they offered me a job, but the exchange rate would not allow me to fly home. And I had a very deep insistence that I would always pay for myself and not have to ask anyone else to provide staples for me, uh, right. like plane tickets. So then I went to the Miami Herald and I also spent a really long, hot summer chasing down um, homicides. And that is also when I began to realize the very serious nexus between uh, instruments of state control, uh, like laying down a highway in the middle of a black community and then being surprised when that introduces social ills uh, and the ways in which the violence of the archive, what Sadia Hartman calls the violence of the archive, whereby uh, institutions do not recognize the legacies of violence that their choices have made and instead report on communities as though these were one-off uh, violences of individual uh, accountability rather than symptoms of a larger social ill. And Toni Morrison said it best when she says you have to know the difference between the symptom and the illness, between the fever and the disease. Yeah. And so I did not uh, go to work with the Miami Herald, but I was very lucky that the executive editor put a call in to the Seattle Post Intelligencer and said, she's heading your way, don't let your opponent hire her. Uh, and so that was the reason I got my job, um, was a phone call. Nice, what, what did you cover at the PI? I began working as a retail reporter, uh, which was not something that I loved. Uh, I did not appreciate uh, Chase, after spending much time in marginalized communities, after uh, working uh, very hard to uh, get a clear understanding of the world um, as shaped by socioeconomic forces, to uh, be holden to like Edgar, right, the uh, SEC filings, mm -hmm. you know, to be chasing down those um, earnings reports on a regular basis, to act as an interlocutor uh, for the base amorality of corporate culture was not something that I loved. But it did teach me something very valuable, which is follow the money, know how to read a balance sheet, know how to write quickly. I mean, I was writing two to three stories a day sometimes. Right. And how to continue kind of gathering string for larger pieces uh, and, how to, and also how to create sourcing in very politically 
fraught environments, right? right? A corporate environment is a cutthroat environment. And yet I still found and developed sources there, which helped me a lot when I went to the Metro desk to bring that business acumen to inv uh, investigating the port of Seattle. And it was there that I think that my uh, time at the PI really began to bear fruit for our community because there was a tremendous amount of cronyism, malfeasance, um, you know, procurement abuse, all kinds of issues at the port that frankly, I should not have been the first person to be reporting on because I was in my early 20s. Right. Uh, but that's one of the things when you're hungry, right? You're a cub reporter and you're willing to put in those long hours and you know you can make things move and you're not yet beholden to what happens to a lot of people. That's the, the power of the outsider. You know, you didn't grow up just kind of taking it for granted or looking the other way. You saw that something was wrong and you weren't afraid to call it out, you know? Um, but then you're there for five years and then like so many newspapers, the bottom falls out, you know, the, 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 it just downsides. They just shut down the print. So many reporters, editors, journalists are laid off. So that's what happened to you. You got, you got laid off, downsized or? Hand in my notice, uh, which was incredible because, you know, when you work like that, when you give it your all, when your quality control is so high and you know that is nothing that you have done that has occasioned this move, that it is a structural erasure that will be a disservice to that community, the future of the city, and to all news readers, whether or not they're reading your stuff, you made the people across town better by working so hard. Right. Um, it was a very humbling experience. Uh, also, I realized at the time I was young. I didn't have children at that time. I did not have dependents. And so I was able to stay in. I served my unemployment uh, with a group of other PI reporters. I mean, we were applying for jobs, but what we were interested in doing was uh, founding Investigate West, a nonprofit news studio that continues to this day, which focuses on uh, investigative reporting about vulnerable people in places of the Pacific Northwest. And yeah, so I, I ended up, yeah. Let's talk about that. I mean, how do you start it? The, the, uh, and did people work for free to, to start? I mean, people needed income. How, how did the reporters make that work? And we, at the time, were part of a very large wave of unemployment, which meant that certain benefits like uh, health care were being provided through COBRA. And uh, there was a very small uh, severance that was associated with uh, the PI's termination of our contracts. Mm -hmm. And um, in combination of those things and kind of living like I had when I had first entered the job market, you know, when you first get a job, and you're like, what could I possibly do with all of this money? And it's a journalism job. So you're about making the same as a cashier, right. you know, but uh, you, at least a Costco cashier. Um, yeah. They pay their people a little bit better. Uh, I, uh, just coasted on my savings, you know, uh, which I had always had because growing up in diaspora, I was taught again and again and again, you may have to, I was taught through example, uh, you may have to start over, right? right? Don't get comfy. Right. Uh, and that actually has been incredibly useful to stay in as a writer ever since. So then I saw you got your MFA from University of Washington. When did you start moving into you know, more creative writing. And, and I saw something interesting in, in, in your bio on your website that you never bought into the objectivity, et cetera, of journalism, which I want to talk about. But, but when did you move into, you know, creative writing out of, out of uh, journalism writing? Well, I had always written in my journal and I had written poetry and created what people call a commonplace book, right? Where you read and you pull quotes from things that you love and you reflect on them. And there are kind of many essayistic uh, vignettes, you know, that are really meant for an audience of one. Uh, and yet, you know, when I was a child, I didn't reach for newspapers. Novels were what saved me. Novels were what made me feel less alone. And that remained true even when I was giving 60 to 80 hours a week to a newspaper. Um, reading the newspaper is not what brought salve to my soul. You know, uh, reading a novel is what allows me to increase the complexity and sophistication of my responsiveness to other beings. And who so, your, yeah. Who are your literary heroes? I see you use a James Baldwin quote in the epigraph. We're gonna talk about subduction in a minute. I'm kind of interested in your writer's journey, but. Who, who were the writers that you were reading or are still reading? Um, you know, at that time, um, I had been focused on uh, history and literature of Latin America, 
with a focus on uh, Cuba during the special period. Like most scholars, extremely focused uh, in order to provide uh, some kind of insight that goes beyond uh, the intellectual production that's happened in the past. So most of the writers that I was reading uh, for school uh, were, you know, um, Retemar, you know, uh, Cabrera Infante, like a number of uh, kind of canonical Latin American authors. But when I wasn't studying uh, for school, I was still reading uh, Latino authors, but I was also very interested in uh, like Milan Kundera, for example, mm -hmm. was someone who has that interwoven philosophical underpinning uh, with still a very uh, strong focus on story and emotion. And that kind of, um, that integration of uh, high idea density with very deep inquiry is something that remains at the heart of uh, my reading. Mm. So when did you get your first fiction published? You know, the thing is about bringing uh, a complex novel that is multicultural and does not rely on dogma and uses ambiguity to try to uh, ask readers to think through the characters rather than allowing the author to decide who is moral and who is not, is that it can be a very long path to publication. And so early on in the process, I think that I had an excerpt published of uh, subduction in, ooh, I'm gonna say 2013 or 2014 uh, in a Pacifica Literary Review. And then uh, City Arts Magazine, which has since folded and was a really great art publication, a glossy uh, in Seattle, uh, also published an excerpt. And um, that was a few years later. Um, but I signed with an agent in 2016. And I signed with Red Hen Press in 2018. And my book came out in 2020. Hmm. So um, let's talk about subduction. First, the title, it's a, it's, a, it's a term of plate tectonics, one slides over the other, and, and uh, certainly the Northwest and Seattle is in, is in that zone, uh, the earthquake zone where, where the earth is moving um, and, and, and fracturing. Um, how did you pick that title and what does that theme mean to you? Obviously, we'll talk about its native culture, non-native culture and things, but, but that title, I want to focus on that title. So one of the things that I did uh, during the, at this point, 15 years of uh, recurrent returns to Macaw Nation in Nia Bay uh, is just driving. It's a four and a half hour trip one way. Right. And so back when I didn't have kids, I would give myself the liberty, even if it was, you know, dusk was falling, to pull over and look at roadside signs. Uh, and so along the Strait of Juan de Fuca, um, there is a uh, sign, a plastic sign, you know, the kind of that thick plastic that clouds and gets a little bit yellow over time. Mm -hmm. And it was about the subduction zone. And at that point, um, you know, the New Yorker had not yet done its big article, like the big one, you know, about how like the West Coast is going to yeah, shear off. That freaked me out. Yeah, but yeah. It yeah. should. Um, and I... Uh, Remember, I had my reporter's notebook. I actually found the reporter's notebook that I wrote it in, and I surrounded it with stars and I underlined it three times. And I realized that um, I had found uh, a way of thinking which could explain this collision and ongoing friction between indigeneity and diaspora. And so it became um, a guide star for all the years of research and writing and revision that followed. And, and you, you tell your story through two primary characters, Claudia, who is a, a anthropologist, she's Latina, she's uh, researching and doing oral histories of the Macaw people. And then Peter is, he's been off the reservation, but now his mother is Maggie, who is somebody that, that uh, Claudia is, is interviewing, becoming, stages of dementia. Anyway, he's coming back. So he's been away and coming back. Claudia is, is suffered through a horrible breakup. Her husband has had an affair with her sister. So, so things are kind of falling apart in both ways. You don't know if they're mm -hmm. running from something or heading towards something so that, you know, 
the way the plates override. So I really like that. But how did you decide to write kind of alternating chapters and, and uh, tell the story that way? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, would have been uh, an easier sell for me would for me to have written a nice coming of age Cuban American story, right? Um, yeah, yeah. That's what the marketing departments want. Yeah. They want to be able to pin the tail on the donkey on your bio and explain uh, the book to others uh, based on your uh, history rather than on the internal logic of the book and how that refracts uh, that of society. And so um, I knew that I was taking a risk to include or to write through the perspective of a native man like Peter. And yet the idea of putting a novel on indigenous territory and then not including the interiority of a tribal member felt to me like casting a film about native peoples with no native peoples or that don't give a native person a screen time. It just would have been a systematic erasure that would not have allowed for the central inquiry of the book, which is about all the things that people do not say to each other. You know, the book really, subduction pivots around what they do not say, more so than what they do say to each other. And yet that, um, that knowledge is held in keeping by the characters and by the reader. So we understand why it is that they're moving around each other in this way uh, and it doesn't have a lot of those big set pieces that, you know, a commercial novel will do where like suddenly someone who has, you know, said nothing or acted in a certain way for 30 years is revealing everything and being transformed in this revelation. It's happening, at, you know, three fourths of the way through the book. And so then we're no, we're on our way out. You know, that's not how life is. Most people live in permanent states of non-disclosure, right? And so I was, as a journalist, I had always been interested in the, the kind of finding that space and revealing that space between what people say and what they do. And that's very, that's the way that we use rhetoric to hold politicians accountable. As a novelist, I'm much more interested in that uh, fertile territory between what we say and what we think. Right. So it's allowed me that access. It seems like there's also a lot of themes of kind of sexual attraction, sexual tension, certainly between the two protagonists and when I first heard the title, it sounds like seduction. You've got to sort of look, is that intentional? And, uh... well, so Heather McHugh, who's a really wonderful, zany genius and a poet, uh, one of the most um, generous of the teachers that I met at University of Washington, she taught me that there are words that contain other words inside of them. And so when you use that word, it cannot help but echo even if it is never spelled in that way. And even if you never actually include that, you know, of course, the the word subduction does not appear in the novel itself. Right. Um, but uh, the tension, right? The both the potential energy and the kinetic energy of that friction imbues the whole book. Mm. So, so talk about the reporter's tools versus the novelist's tools because the opening scene is this powerful fairy ride Claudia is, is, is fleeing this, this horrible, uh, unfaithful husband, but it's so tactile and so the sights and smells of the Northwest and, and what a ferry ride is like and, you know, the, the, the water on the railings to the sound to the smells. Do you take that ferry ride and take a notebook or are you just kind of remembering it and, um, how do you go about the practice of writing those types of scenes? Do you like, you know, reporter's notebook, I got a ton of them behind me on the floor here too. Like we like to write everything down, but is that the way you approach it as a novelist too? Or Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's completely necessary because even once you have some of those basic elements, right? Like the precise way it smells or the change of light when you go from outside to inside the ferry, or the way that the wind whistles through the railings, you know, when it, they are wet. Like all of those things are things that you can only see through direct observation. And most people forget the majority of what they see. And so I- Getting in their yeah. cars early. That always kills them. Like, why are you going back to your car? They just get like ready to, ready to go. And, and yeah. uh, the way you described coming into the, the landing with the piers and things. Yeah, it's just beautifully written. Um, 
But that was the other question. Is that invented? I've never taken a ferry to up to Nia Bay. I didn't know there was one. You talked about the long drive. I thought you had to drive up there. Is there so the way it works is that you leave Seattle. Um, some people will take the ferry from Edmonds to Kingston. Uh, but I have always taken the ferry from Bainbridge Island to, or excuse me, from Seattle to Bainbridge Island because I want to avoid the traffic going from South Seattle to Edmonds. Um, and oh. I-5 is not good. It's not good. And so, uh, but a lot of Macaw peoples actually drive around. They drive, and I have done that on summer weekends when it's looking like a multiple hour ferry wait. You know, you go down around through uh, Tacoma and then uh, back up kind of parallel to the Hood Canal and then uh, hang, you know, get on 101 and then finally 112 and then you're there. Yeah. Um, but even if you go to Bainbridge Island, you still have to make your way across the Hood Canal, which is a really interesting feature of the Olympic Peninsula because. It contains the only fjord in the lower 48, right. uh, Deva Bay, and that was carved by this underbelly of a glacier where there was a rise and then it came up and over the rise and then churned and caused this fjord. And then that spat out uh, heading south and that whole line of the Hood Canal was a glacial river. Mm. Uh, and so I really love how you can learn about the land and understand the legacies of prior eras uh, as if you're paying attention. So I would, while I was driving as well, I would dictate notes into my phone. Mm. So, you know, this is a, a society that has been abused and misused and misrepresented by outsiders. And you're an outsider coming in. How do you get access and trust and respect. I see in your acknowledgments, you seem to get very close to some of the Macaw people. How, how did they let you in or how did you get inside to get what you needed to create this novel? Well, I mean, the fact is I went back for years. Showing up is so important. Showing up as your full self, which is something that we as journalists are taught to hold back, is even more important. Showing up with your vulnerability, showing up with your children. You know, showing up in a real way and then going back and making sure, you know, when I first started going out to Nia Bay, you know, a lot of it, I was like, oh, I'm camping, you know, I'm on the beach, I'm going to Shy Shy, I'm kind of, you know, I'm really taking in the landscape. And then over time, I'm like, no, I need to see this person and this person and this person and this person and this person. And so, you know, it would really be kind of um, uh, recurrent cyclical visits uh, with people with whom I had very extended conversations that may have begun in an awkward way. Um, but people are like, you know, what are you doing here? But they're also, you know, I was a young woman when I showed up. I'm no longer young. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of young, I'm almost 40, right? But, you know. <laughs> quite a few years on you, don't have to worry. <laughs> but, you know, 15 years ago, they're like, what are you doing here all by yourself? Right. You know, and I'm like, well, I'm a reporter, but I'm not here as a reporter. They're like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm curious, who are y'all, you know? It was so uh, incredible to me having been in a family that had to leave Spain under Franco and then had to leave Cuba under Batista and then couldn't go back because of Castro, right? And then for me, I had gone from living in Tampa to living in California to going to school at Harvard, you know, to being in New York, to going to Buenos Aires, to reporting from Miami, to being in Seattle. And then I meet these people and some of them, uh, most of them who were living out there had been living there their whole lives and they were from there they were of this place in a way that i had not been uh taught even though my family in spain had probably been in that region since the bronze age um the they were in galicia which is kind of this agricultural uh area in northwest spain mm. um to meet people whose uh claim to a place extends back millennia required me to completely reorient my thinking about what it meant to belong to a place. And so that's why one of the central inquiries of the book is that what does it mean to belong? And what can you claim in diaspora? What should you not claim? Uh, and so using the project of this anthropologist who very quickly flouts ethical boundaries that I have adhered to my entire life, right? right? But she's a hot mess. She drags her damage right into that community Right. And she doesn't do because she's on this kind of capitalist pinwheel of uh, that still extends to academic spaces. Um, you know, there is very little room for personhood within capitalism. 
she doesn't take the sabbatical to like heal and grieve and figure out what she's going to do in the wake of this devastation. She's like, you know what? I'm going to combine this with a research trip, you know, and I'm going to spend, I'm fleeing Seattle, but I'm going to get things done. So it's like, I'm okay. Right. I'm okay. Right. And we're all doing that right now in this pandemic. Mm. We all need to be giving ourselves time to grieve and time to heal and time to connect. And for the most part, what I see is people desperately trying to maintain their old work habits, which is the same thing that I've been doing, frankly. <laughs> um, so talk about uh, the reaction from the Macaw people that opened up to you and, and that you know shared so much. Have they read the novel? Have you uh, shown them you know early drafts or uh, excerpts or anything like that? Or so I did share pre-publication uh, the manuscript with the uh, board president of the Macaw Cultural and Research Center, Mayor Parker, uh, who was gracious enough to uh, say that she was with me in spirit uh, during my uh, book launch uh, at, uh, that was hosted by Hugo House. Um, and I'm grateful to the ways in which uh, my friends over the years have uh, accepted and supported uh, the work that I was doing, um, particularly Janine Ledford uh, read an essay that I wrote for Literary Hub about decolonizing the research process and offered me her thoughts. And that is real work. It's intellectual work. It's emotional labor. And uh, I appreciate very much that particularly those two women uh, gave of their minds in that way uh, to this project. Um, I do think it's important to note, and I think you can see within the book, that despite being a, a small town, um, it's not a monolithic culture. Right. Uh, there are very many ways of practicing the very same culture. And uh, because uh, there are so many shared claims to cultural properties, uh, there are um, counterclaims uh, to some of those cultural properties. So when I tell you that my friend who is a basketry elder, a uh, basketry weaver and an elder, um, whose book I helped her to edit um, over a period of years, when I say that she you know, bought three copies from an indie bookstore and gave them to her children, that's not to imply that those children enjoyed it or shared it with their friends or that the Macaw people accept my work. It's right. only that the people with whom I have um, had extended contact have continued to show kindness, even in virtual spaces. So you know, when the book was a finalist for some International Latino Book Awards, uh, one of my friends, uh, Joe McGimsey, posted it on Facebook. And I was grateful to him for that. Uh, it's a true generosity to use your own social network platform to share the professional accomplishment of somebody else, especially when it involves a creative production that deals with cultural appropriation in a very meta aware way. And I find that the kind of ongoing complexity and sophistication of these people who are living, in fact, in a remote rural location uh, exceeds that of many of the urbanites that I know. Um, macaws are extremely well-traveled, uh, many of them through, you know, journeying out to basketball tourneys or bone games or cultural exchanges with other tribes have been, you know, really all over the world and interacted in a very uh, real and constructive way with other indigenous peoples and other governments. So uh, they are on point, right? Yeah. And so, um, I have been very grateful for the support and welcome that I have received thus far, but I don't expect that every person who reads this book is going to have the same kind of reaction. In fact, I deliberately in the text left ambiguities, which would cause people to reflect in a recurrent way. And depending on where someone is in that spectrum of reflection, they may have the very same person may have different ideas about this book uh, as they progress through reading it and then as they progress in the weeks that follow reading it. And I do think that endings should be as what uh, Jane Hirschfeld, the poet, uh, said is a gong, right? The ending is a gong, but the thing that is reverberating is the mind of the reader. Mm. And I think that that transfer of energy into the intellect of the reader is one of the best yields of fiction and yet, in order not to control that process, I made very sure to, I hope, uh, leave it um, untraceable what I think about what each of these protagonists 
have done to each other and to the people around them. Mm. Um, it's not for me to judge them. All I was trying to do was understand them. Excellent. Um, do you write poetry as well? Because the, the, uh, the sentences to me are so uh, lyrical and compressed that they feel almost like prose poems in some ways and things. Do you also write poetry as well? I have written poetry. I will say that I relied on uh, reading this book aloud many times to myself. I put it through 20 drafts, um, many rounds of readers, uh, some of them just me, others, you know, getting feedback. I, I finished my second draft uh, right before I gave birth to my first son. And so I used my maternity leave as my brain refresher and I'd sent, you know, the, the piece to, or sent the manuscript to a round of readers and then got their feedback beginning like a month and a half later and then began to kind of salt in those wisdoms and my reactions and figuring out my emotional versus intellectual reactions to commentary. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in that process um, helped make it what it is. And you mentioned Hugo House. I'd, I'd like you to talk about it because you had the two year, you know, writer in residency uh, there, 2018 to 2020. And it seems like a wonderful community of writers. I'm embarrassed to say I, I don't know it because I, I've never been there, but I read uh, a lot about it online uh, the other night. Um, talk about that and how important is that to your feeling of community of writers as somebody who's moved all over early in your career? Does that feel like a, a central place for you as a writer? You know, by the time that I was in consideration for becoming prose writer in residence at Hugo House, I had already appeared on their stage 13 times. Wow. And yeah. with someone who doesn't have a book out, right? Right. That's a big deal. Yeah. They gave me a platform to share my work and find community with other people. And frankly, I was encouraged. Uh, one of the people that I went to University of Washington with, Tara Atkinson, said, oh, you know who would be a good teacher for you? It would be Kristen. And so they, you know, contacted me. At this point, I had my first son and I was uh, just shy of giving birth to my second son. And they were 18 months apart. Okay, so, um, That's so I gave him, I gave, I, so I gave birth in uh, October. Uh, I mean, it's, I'm kind of like this anyways, I kind of like to press deadline. I filed my last uh, story about the Oso mudslide for The Guardian when I was a week overdue for my second child. <laughs> I was, they called me, they're like, do you want to do this? I'm like, okay, but I, so I need you to know I might go into labor. And they're like, I don't know if you should do it. I'm like, nah, I totally got this. I got this. It's a fine. Uh, filed, wrote a bunch of thank you notes for my baby shower, gave birth, you know? Uh, and that's the reality of being a working mother. Uh, so by the time that I uh, was teaching my class, it was January, but that's only, you know, two, three months out from birth. Right. And I remember... Uh, I was making photocopies of a uh, work of, by Annie Dillard uh, for the time being, which is a beautiful book that I uh, use its interwoven threaded narrative to show what's possible through the collage form. And Maggie Nelson, the author of The Argonauts and The Art of Cruelty and Bluets, a fantastic writer, one of our nation's, I think, most exciting writers, was in the copy room because she was about to give, you know, a craft talk. At this time, no, I'm, now I'm giving craft talks, right? But no one was asking me to give craft talks at this time. And so I'm sitting here, I'm looking at her, I'm like totally starry eyed and I'm mad because I had to teach my class rather than going to see her event. And she looks at me and The Argonauts is a really beautiful book about that, that makes pregnancy, uh, that, that asserts correctly that the pregnant body is a valid site for scholarly inquiry. Mm. Um, so I'm photocopying Annie Dillard and, uh, and Maggie Nelson, you know, says, oh my God, I have to tell Annie that you're teaching this work because she, I was a research assistant for that book. And, you know, she was uh, mad that it wasn't, you know, in educational uh, curricula as much as it should be given its inquiries and its, um, its quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and and when, she when, 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 when Nelson realized how soon I was from the birth process. She said to me, I'll never forget it. She's like, I was not photocopying three months out, <laughs> you know? Sure. And so it's not, so there is the um, connections I made with other Seattle writers uh, through uh, those live performances and through being in classes and then through then teaching classes. And then there are these kind of fantastic moments that happen because of the, the physical juxtaposition of two writers in a room 
who are willing to see each other. And that is what I've always found uh, personally at Hugo House. It's what I have uh, tried to curate at, at Hugo House as a mentor. And part of my job was to mentor uh, more than 100 writers for an hour each, reflecting on their drafts and then giving them uh, developmental edits and um, strategic advice about their literary hopes over the past two years. So one of the things I try to curate is this notion that we should, as writers, try to see each other and not look past each other on our way out or up, mm -hmm. right? And I think Hugo House has, over the years, has been for me a place where I can see people again and again and again, and in that process, come to know myself. That's beautiful. Um, so, uh, Chris Samiaris Young, this has been fantastic, but to kind of play us out, do you have a copy of Seduction Close by? Would you be able to um, grace us with reading maybe the opening page or two of, uh, of uh, or a, a, another section that you uh, are having? Sure, I, ha I have a, a little three page section right in the beginning. Be Thank good. you so much for having me uh, into this conversation. I was uh, delighted to receive your email and uh, now to know you, and I hope that despite the fact that we've met in a virtual space, uh, we may uh, continue to Absolutely. have this conversation. I mean, we've got Seattle in common. I do want to, next time I'm out seeing my family, I do want to stop at Hugo House and, and our, our mutual friend, Marion Roach Smith is an incredible writer and memoir teacher and, and she'll keep us connected as well. Oh, you should tell her to apply to teach a class there. Um, people, they're teaching all classes virtually right now. Yep. Um, okay. Yes. <clears throat> the shore pulled away. Froth churned from its feet to hers. The engines hummed through her bones. From the aft deck, Claudia looked back toward the city they made home. She searched the skyline for places they had been happy. The top of the Space Needle, a waterfront park, the Ferris wheel, until her westward passage split the horizon into expanses of gray, demarcated into sea and sky by hue alone. Puget Sound opened in fathoms below the ferry. Now, Claudia left town without saying her goodbyes. Seattle was a small world. Movers must have swarmed her house to clear out Andrew's belongings in the space of one morning. The neighbors would have seen. What had they seen? She couldn't bring herself to ask whether her sister had been on site to supervise, and Claudia hid her phone in case someone felt like texting unsolicited glimpses of Maria deciding what to take, practicing wifeliness, slipping Andrew a kiss for courage as the first box was packed. Claudia pictured Maria's thick curls, her narrow shoulders, her rounded hips, birthing hips. The broadcaster's voice echoed through the loudspeakers, cautioning passengers about unknown items and suspicious activity. It was cowardly of Andrew not to deliver the news in person, worse still, Maria. Did they think Claudia would handle it poorly? That she was dangerous? Listening to the roar of the props, Claudia saw what her fate might have been, her body lying in the bathtub, blue and bloated, afloat. Her stomach twisted. It was more than she could take or forgive. They knew what they were doing, she thought, and yet they believe I deserve it. Gulls swept the boat's wake. She was surprised by how close they came, how she could see feathers tracing their sinuous curves, how they were suddenly beautiful, not the splattering scavengers they had been, but flight itself. Right now, everyone I know is stuck at a desk, and then there's me on my way out to the field. As a child in Mexico, she'd always wanted to go somewhere anywhere, away. She had always studied people. She never envisioned herself as an anthropologist, preferring something more dashing, like explorer. But here she was, en route to the Macaw Reservation at Nia Bay, an old whaling village on the northwest tip of the lower 48, Indian country. Last year, she noticed Andrew timing her periods, his prick vanishing 10 days after she first bled, which was almost funny because lately, she found herself wanting to be careless, to chance it. Folding up her body in her side of the bed, ovulating alone whenever she could manage it, she had made it through her 30s unscathed, and that was when they were still trying. But now, she thought, now I'm old. I'd have a baby with Downs if I could have one at all. I don't know, I just wanted something from myself. Still do, something for myself, something bigger than myself, bigger than all of this. I don't know how to get it without wanting it. Why couldn't you understand? Besides, what kind of man fucks his wife's sister? Claudia tilted her head to consider the inverse. What kind of wife would allow her husband to become so close to her sister that he could fall for her, fall inside of her, fill her up? 
Only a conniving bitch would wrap her legs around her brother-in-law. Maria's legs were curvy, great gams, Andrew once said. In horror of excess flesh, Claudia carved herself to gristle. Maria's thighs bloomed. Claudia imagined they would shake in sweaty reverberation during sex, a shuddering, imprayerful response to the call of loin striking flank, so unlike the flat slap of mu muscle her own lovemaking had become. And last month, when her fingers crept between buttons to his curly nest, his hand rose to still her wayward progress. She left her arm on top of him, trying to act natural, like this was cuddling. They pretended to sleep. It took 10 minutes to roll onto her back and concede. It's terrible to be uneasy in your own bed. She hadn't felt that way since college, but this time it was her husband. And having had his love and lost it made her physically ill. A malaise so invasive, it was as though she were at altitude, body shutting down extremities, fingertips first. She signed the papers to be done with it. He wanted out. Thanks. Thank you. It's the debut novel of a of exciting uh, new writer, a new novelist rather, Kristen Mayaris Young. She's also an investigative journalist, a essayist, a teacher. She's coming to us from Seattle. The book is Subduction, published by Red Hen Press. You can find it there online or your local independent bookseller. Thank you very much for joining us, Kristen. Good luck with uh, your ongoing uh, literary career. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot.